happening today? What are we doing? Uh, we're going to be talking to these two guys about Bigfoot. Um, you know, it should be pretty interesting. What do you think Bigfoot is? I don't know. I have no idea, but we're going to learn about it. All right, let's go find out. Okay. Well, welcome, you guys. This is an exciting topic. So how long have you guys known each other? Uh, 15, 16, 17 years, something like that. Yeah, somewhere in there. Now, where did you meet? We met on expedition. We met in the um, Northern California Redwoods uh, while looking for Sasquatches. Now, there's when you look for Sasquatch, I mean, it, I, I think one of you I read, it took years before you ever even heard Sasquatch, yeah? Both of us. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that's the case for most people. I, I, not most people, I guess. Some people. Uh... Priscilla, can you hear us? Yeah. Can we just, hi, hi, gentlemen. Hello. Oh, you overestimate us. Well, okay. <laughs> I have a dangerous uh, creature here with me today too, so I might bring him up in a minute. But want to just introduce you because it is a podcast, although we watch it. So thank you for joining us. I know you are both the experts in searching for. Are we calling it Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Squatch? Yeah, with a C H at the end. T C H actually at the end. Squatch. Okay, Squatch. Sasquatch. Just Sasquatch. Okay. You're saying Sasquatch. Okay, well, I'd like to Okay, such, right? Yeah, Something like, I like well, it. okay, if it's this complicated, it's big foot. <laughs> okay, anyway, so sorry, I just want to make sure people who are tuning in are going to get the full advantage. And, and I, I thought it was Boba, but it says Bobes. Oh, that's a nickname of a nickname. Oh, the, <laughs> and Cliff. Okay, I'm Priscilla. Hello. I'm Priscilla. Okay, continue on how you met. <laughs> from what I remember, um, and my memory's foggy at best on a good day, but from what I remember, it was on a BFRO, Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization um, trip to uh, the Northwest Coast in the yeah. Redwoods. Yeah. And, you know, and a, a number of people were there. Uh, Matt Moneymaker, who's one of our colleagues on Finding Bigfoot, he was there. It was his trip, actually, and we we're invited out. And uh, Bobo was there, and I was there, and a number of other people who I'm still friends with to this day who are, were all out there. So is it, is there, a lot, is it a community of people who go on these trips that you tend to know for a long time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I yeah think, back, I then, think back then we were kind of all coming together, like everyone because of the internet, like in the late 90s, early 2000s. Because mm -hmm. um, I didn't know hardly any big footers before that. I mean, I'd met a few, but it was, it was, you know, but then the internet just, the explosion of that just brought people together and then um but there's there's definitely factions in the bigfoot world you know like there's flesh and blood there's the spirit paranormal crew there's like the ufo bigfoot connection crew and um so that's the flesh, downside of the internet is yeah. yeah so you mean there's <laughs> even within the world of bigfoot there's there's different there there's ways that people think about it differently yeah yeah Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. you, you picture, uh, you know, you have to be a pretty pig-headed kind of person to be investigating Sasquatches in the first place, because uh, right. uh, you're looking into something that everybody else is telling you isn't even real. And right. so you get a bunch of pig-headed people together with kind of um, nebulous, uh, not always accurate or well-supported data, mm -hmm. um, and then they can come to their own conclusions. And it, God, it's, it's almost like a religion sometimes for some people. Um, it, it's, it's, in some ways, it's, it's really great and awesome and funny, and in other ways, it's kind of sad and pathetic. It's, it's a lot of things, actually. Right. It's, like politics. Yeah, right. it's like politics. It's like politics or religion or anything else like that. Can I get 60 seconds from each of you about what was the first moment that it captured your imagination? Because you've been doing this a long time. Did you read about it? Someone tell you about it? How did you each of you? Okay, Bobo, you go first. Um, I saw the Patterson Gillen film. When I was about five years old or so. I was in, I remember I was like kindergarten. And it just, it looked, I looked at it and that was right when, uh, well, yeah, it was when the Planet of the Apes was on TV. Like they were airing like a series, like the run of Planet of the Apes movies. And I remember looking at that and I knew those were fake. And then looking at the Patterson Gillen film, going, that looks real. And I just started reading everything I could find on it, which wasn't much back then. I mean, by the time I was like in third grade, I read every Bigfoot related book you could possibly read that had ever been published. And then now it's just, they come out every week, 10, 10 books a week or something. But back then it was a lot less, but yeah, I was definitely seeing the Patterson Gillen film that just lit the fire. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, Cliff, how did it, how did you get into this? 
Well, I grew up in the 1970s. I was born in 1970s. So uh, my formative years, you know, I guess I was always the weird kid in class anyway. I'm um, always keeping uh, eccentric uh, interests right. and, and, and interested in, you know, UFOs and, and crystal skulls and the whole like in search of gamut, you know, so mm-hmm. like television documentaries really. Kind well, of in search fire. of was great, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, it was wonderful. Best. Yeah, wonderful. I own the box set actually yeah. now. But, um, but so I've always been interested in weird stuff, but, but I never really investigated or re- truly researched it until yeah. I was in college. Uh, it was always one of those back burner sort of things. I wanted Bigfoot to be real, but I had no reason to think it was or wasn't. Mm-hmm. But when I was in college, um, I had a few hour break between classes on the opposite side of campus, a really big campus, Cal State Long Beach. And so I would um, poke around in the library and kind of just poke pulled books off the shelves and subjects that I was interested in, which happened to be mostly sciences, even to this day. I, I like reading nonfiction a lot more than I reading fiction, for example. And then I stumbled across a couple books, really, that were uh, collections of scholarly journals, uh, articles written on Sasquatches by anthropologists and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, cultural anthropologists and physical anthropologists. And when I actually started reading about the evidence that had been collected on Sasquatches and and really digesting these things and weighing it in my head, I realized that, oh my God, Sasquatches are not only eccentric and funny and cool, they're probably real animals. You know, and since I was already backpacking and camping, I just started basically going and backpacking and camping in places where people had seen Sasquatches before. Um, Because at the end of the day, Bigfooting is kind of like camping with a purpose. So I just started doing that uh, a, a lot back in 1994. And here I am today, literally drowning in the subject. You know, from the 70s, you know, to, not, to the 90s, what, what tipped you over to actually going into the woods and looking? Because that's a long time. I remember in the 70s, it was a very popular subject. There were always books and things and, you know, around it. And then all of a sudden it sort of stopped. So what got you in, in 94 just to push into it? The evidence. It was the evidence. It was reading about the scientific evidence that had been collected and the congruency of that evidence. Um, and, and so I decided, well, I'm going to camp and do all these things that I already was doing, but just kind of keeping an ear out or an eye out for Sasquatches and kind of and camping specifically in places where people had seen them. Um, instead of, I, I would do a lot less desert camping, for example, and I would do a lot more camping in the Redwoods in Northern California, um, where, where a lot more sighting reports happen. And, and yeah, have guys. you guys seen a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot? And what's the difference between a Sasquatch and a Bigfoot? Is that the same name? For yeah. this, is that different names for the same thing? Same yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. The word Sasquatch is an Anglo, Anglicization, I think the word is. Like, um, it, it's kind of a, a bastardization I, I, of, a, of a native term, a Coast Salish term um, that I can't pronounce well. And I, I certainly can't spell because um, the Coast Salish language has um, sounds in it that, don't, that, that can't be Englished very well you know um and so there was this teacher this white guy that was a teacher on the stahela's reserve um up in british columbia outside of harrison hot springs in the 1920s and he he had he taught he was a teacher in the community and he knew a lot of native people and were friends with them and he would hear stories about these giant hair covered indians in the woods you know eight foot tall giant hair covered people out in the woods and he was what he heard them so often and actually spoke to people who had seen them he thought that was really curious. So he started writing, um, you know, uh, magazine articles about it, basically. But he couldn't spell the word for these things because it, you can't English that word. So he kind of bastardized it into a Sasquatch because you could spell that. And then, of course, Bigfoot came about in 1958 uh, from Bluff Creek up where Bobo lives um, from a road building crew that found footprints going across their churned up road as they were building it. So. But same animal, same animal. It's a continent-wide distribution of the same species. Um, they're so el- elusive; they're hard to see. Like, what? What? Have, have you got? First of all, have you guys seen them? Have you ever been near one? Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I've seen. I've seen them several times. Nothing great. Like, uh, I haven't had that. I'm still waiting for that. Just one where like walks in front of the headlights and you see the muscles rippling. And the, I got one daylight glimpse of one, pretty near where the Patterson Goodwin film was made on Bluff Creek. I saw one there about 13 years ago. That's my only daylight setting, and it was just a brief glimpse. It was halfway leaned out behind a tree. I saw the left half of the body. The thing was tall. It wasn't the other ones I'd seen it night before that were uh, real big, huge, powerful looking. I mean, just big. I could just see the mass of them, you know, like giant, broad shoulders, very tall, just tons, just 
off the scale of anything human size. Are you, were they male? Do you think they were male or they female? Yeah, because uh, I think they were male. Well, generally speaking, the males for the most part are more V-shaped, like uh, bodybuilders. Yes. And then the females are more like block shaped or apple shaped, like way broader hips, like the shoulders and the hips are more evenly the same breadth. And the Sasquatch, the males are generally taller and more of a V shape, like broad shouldered. Did you see one clip? Yeah, I think I have. It's, it was even a worse sighting than Bobo's though. Um, it, it was through a thermal imager, um, but there was, uh, it, it, from my guess, is about 70, 80 yards away, standing on the hillside um, at night, 2.30 in the morning, at about two miles off trail at a place where no one knew we were going to be. And, um, and it didn't walk like a person. It was clearly either a human being or a Sasquatch. And mm -hmm. uh, just so you know, a thermal imager sees heat. It doesn't see light. Um, so I saw a, an outline of a human-shaped figure. Bobo saw the same one, by the way, I think. Um, yeah. And he, it was an outline of a human figure just standing there in the dark looking at this. We were filming the show, actually, at the time, Finding Bigfoot, just kind of watching the circus go on down below, you know. And um, it was in an, a quiet valley where numerous people have reported both seeing and encountering Sasquatches and having rocks thrown at them and being screamed at and stuff before over years of over over a period of years and there was this thing standing on the hill over there with and um one of our colleagues uh, matt moneymaker kind of went after it and the thing started moving it was it quickly outpaced matt um and mm -hmm. what's significant about that is that it wasn't using a flashlight matt had thermal imager and a night vision monocular and was going right. after this thing and this thing just quickly moved through the uh the wooded hillside without a light at 2 30 in the morning about um, quickly outpaced everybody. We never saw it again. And then we got a uh, vocalization off the same hillside about 30 or 40 minutes later. So I can't say 100% for sure that wasn't the Sasquatch, but, it is, but I think the, the, the context strongly suggests it. Did you record that sound, the woof? Uh, my recorder was in fact running, but apparently didn't pick it up. Um, uh, and what do you think, that, are, uh, how intelligent does it seem like they are or not? Because they're obviously great at hiding. So they, 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 must, they must either be smarter than us or much faster or something. I mean, what, what are your thoughts well, on that? They're definitely much faster. They're, they're super, super, they're like super, they're beyond the scale of human in any way as far as physical strength and speed. Um, they're smart, but I think they're kind of like, what do they call them? Like idiots, savants, or like they're a genius at one thing or a few things. And, but they're kind of not as, we would get smart as a human in, in a lot of other ways, but as far as evasion, staying hidden, and knowing the land and working with the environment, they're head and shoulders above us, but they're not building suspension bridges or planes or this or that. They don't seem to use much tools if, at all. I mean, they use very, uh, they're not much above chimpanzees or orangutans as far as tool use. I mean, they use rocks to throw them when they hunt or to drive off, drive off humans or other like bears or something and throw rocks at them. Then they'll use uh, sticks for like like uh, fishing out insects out of a uh, ant mound or something like that. Like a chimp will do. They'll do like that. But uh, they're smart enough to have jobs or pay taxes. Or <laughs> wait, I mean, how do you know they're so strong? You said they're really strong. How do? You, what's the evidence that they're strong? Tree branches and uh, trees. Uh, the actual trunk itself that they snap. Yeah, they've been seen doing amazing feats of strength as well, as well as throwing quite large rocks. Um, the size of my head or more at great distances with high accuracy as well. And also we, uh, we know that strength is a function of uh, the, the, the cross section of a muscle. And the, the, when you consider that like literally their legs are the size of right. my torso, you know, that's a huge cross section, you know, in, um, in martial arts or whatever, you're always taught to, to punch or whatever, or kick with, with your waist, because that's the biggest section, cross section of muscle. But imagine their legs are like that. Their arms are probably hardly smaller than that. Um, so, and when you consider chimpanzees have the strength and chimpanzees, a three or four foot tall chimpanzee has the strength of six to eight times a human yeah. being. Um, well, you, the, the, the strength of something the size of a Sasquatch, just like Bobo says, it must be literally off the charts. Just ridiculous. Have we ever found a nest or, or where they sleep? Yeah. 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 Well, um, I don't think they sleep necessarily in the nest. We don't know what the nests are for, but we, there, there have been nests found. I, um, they've also been observed sleeping on the open ground. So we, we don't know for sure that they make nests on a nightly basis, but there is a, a really compelling um, case being studied 
as I speak, um, up in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington, there's a group of Bigfooters that are friends of ours called the Olympic Project. Um, and uh, they were pointed to these strange ground nests, um, a logging um, owner and operator, a timber cruiser, was out cruising his patch of timber, choosing which trees to harvest, because that's what timber cruisers do. And he ran across a large ground nest, and he'd never seen anything like it before in his life. And he remembered, oh, I, I know that one guy, Derek Randalls, he's into Bigfoot. Maybe this is what that is. Yeah, uh, cause cause bear, it, because bears make ground nests, too, that are similar, but they're not nearly as intricate. So a lot of people just will see a Bigfoot nest and write it off as a bear nest. But there's right. Cliff can tell you why the difference yeah, and, and, but basically this guy who had been t cruising timber for 30 years, like he'd seen most everything there is out in the woods. He ran across this structure on the ground that kind of looked like a big bird nest. He goes, I don't know what that is. And so he called in Derek and Derek's no slouch in the woods. He's spent a ton of time out there and he'd never seen anything like it. So um, being a, a good amateur scientist, a citizen scientist, because we're not academics, we're, we're, we're kind of carrying the torch for the academics until they muster up the courage to get involved. Um, well, Derek called in a bear biologist because that was the other obvious possibility, you know, because a good citizen scientist or any scientist is always trying to prove themselves wrong. If I think that's a Bigfoot footprint, I'm going to try to prove it's not. And maybe if I, you know, that kind of thing. Well, Derek called in a bear biologist and the bear biologist was puzzled by the thing as well. And he, the bear biologist pointed out that if this is bear behavior, this is undocumented bear behavior, you know, and you wouldn't think there's a lot of undocumented black bear behavior left, you know, there's certainly some, but anyway, um, uh, these nests were discovered. Uh, there, there's, there's over 20 of them that have been found now along about a half mile or so stretch of ridgeline. Um, that seems like a really high concentration of, of nests to make if they were just sleeping in them one night and moving on. Um, they, I think they might be used for another reason. And um, these guys have been scouring. And you know what's interesting? Everybody talks about the logging conspiracies and stuff. And, you know, and loggers in the past might have had to sign NDAs if they discovered Sasquatch uh, footprints or something like that. Um, but this logging operation, and the guy who owns it, the literal owner, said, you know what? We're not going to log this patch for five years. You have five years to study this. Um, and four years afterwards, another sec uh, series of nests have been discovered now, as recently as this past uh, winter, like last February. And I was I was privy to check those out. Like, how would you describe it though? Is, is it is it an animal? Is it a primate? Is it what, what what in your mind? Like, how do you talk about it to 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 your loved ones? They are absolutely animals, but you know what? So am I. I mean, what am I? A plant? You know, plant, protist, animal. I mean, really, what options do you have? And I, that, that question, are they animals or are they people? Say, well, what do you think people are, right? No, they are absolutely animals. The question is, how people-like are they? How human-like are they? Because we know, I mean, and, and you can talk about morphology. You know, even if you go all the way back to Linnaeus, the guy who invented the science of taxonomy, you know, naming the genus species, all that sort of stuff. He invented that stuff. He was, it was a very Christian time back in the 1600s, right? Very, very, very you know, superstitious and spooky about all that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, he was really nervous about trying to classify humans at all because it because when he looked and he, he dissected apes and the only apes known at that time were um, orangutans and I think chimpanzees or did that come a little bit later? But orangutans were I know. And so when he started looking at the ape hands and feet and body structure, he was really creeped out because he goes, well, I can't say that they're in our family or we're related to them because, you know, I'll go to hell or, you know, or certainly all the priests will tell me I'm going to hell and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but now we're, I, I'd like to think we're a little bit, most of us are a little bit more light, enlightened than that nowadays. Um, and we can recognize that the apes are our biological family, right? Um, so now the question is, how, where on the gradient do they lie is a more appropriate question because they're clearly primates. They have shoulders for brachiation, which is overhead hanging and stuff, hands and fingers. They don't have a tail, so that would make them not a monkey. It's an ape, um, just like us. We're an ape as well, right, biologically. So where on the gradient do they lie with gibbons being the lesser apes on one side and then humans on the other, right? Um, so far, the closest living relative in the ape hominid family would be the bonobo, the pygmy chimpanzee. We share over 98.3 or 4% of our DNA with them. It's identical. But, you know, that sounds like a lot. But when you consider that we share over 60% of our DNA with earthworms, it seems a little less dramatic, you know. But um, so are they in that little stretch? Uh, it depends what they are. There's a couple different, uh, there's a couple interesting hypotheses that suggest that they could be a couple things. Like there's a, the most famous one is the Gigantopithecus 
hypothesis. There's a fossil ape that we know existed for a fact that stood, that was about the same size as a Sasquatch. Um, we don't know if it stood on two legs or four, or it was a knuckle walker like the gorillas and whatnot. We don't know that about them. All we know is, uh, uh, is based on their teeth and uh, four or five jaw bones that we have. We don't have any postcranial uh, fossils at all. Nothing about their body or even the head shape beyond the jaws, okay? But we know that they were in the right place and they went extinct about 100,000 years ago. Uh, at right time, right place, which is Vietnam, China, and all that sort of area, India, that's where the fossils are from. Um, and they're the right size. So right place, right, right time, right size, and maybe come over the land bridge and be a Sasquatch you know, later. I think there's another interesting possibility though, because Gigantopithecus, the one I just mentioned, is more in the orangutan line. And the thing about that is orangutans don't have brow ridges and their ancestors, the Shivapithecines, also did not have brow ridges. Sasquatches have brow ridges. Okay, so we need, it's not to say that he couldn't evolve those independently, but let's look at other possibilities. Um, when you look at the, um, the hominin line, not hominid, hominin with an N at the end, which is a fancy word for um, human ancestors and all the, the offshoots thereof, like Neanderthals were a hominin. Um, Homo erectus was a hominin, all that sort of stuff. Extinct or not, it doesn't matter. We're hominins. Um, one of the hominin species, if you go back far enough, um, called the Australopithecines. Um, you know about Australopithecines. Uh, you know the Lucy skeleton, the Lucy fossil. She was an Australopithecine. Okay, she was Australopithecine. I didn't know, Lucy. I didn't know about Lucy. I'm sorry. Oh, you didn't? Oh, no. In 1974, a very, very famous uh, fossil had been discovered um, in, in Eastern Africa, um, and they nicknamed her Lucy because they're listening to the Beatles at the time, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Um, and, and it blew everybody's mind because this was a bipedal ape. Actually, the first time that we actually had something like a chimpanzee that walked bipedally, okay? And they were about three to five feet tall. And there's a bunch of different species, but enough of those species were, were so there are two, basically two, two big kinds. And I'm getting back to your question, and I'm sorry I'm rambling, but two main points. Um, one type, actually a whole family of Australopithecines were slender, sort of thin, bipedal chimpanzee things. And that's what eventually led to us in some sort of way. But there was this other branch that was thick and muscular and robust. In fact, they called them Australopithecus robustus. They were so different that they gave them a new genus name, Paranthropus. And if you look at a Paranthropus, they're basically Bigfoot at about four or five feet tall. And I think the Paranthropus, uh, the Paranthropocenes need to be looked at very closely as a possible ancestor for Sasquatch. Because if it's true, then they're much more closely related to us than chimpanzees are. And in fact, they're um, an offshoot of a human ancestor, which would make them kind of, you know, human-ish in some ways, in a lot more ways than a lot of people might be comfortable with. You know, as so, the, if they're close to Neanderthals, didn't humans, you know, mate with Neanderthals and are part of where we are now? I mean, is that, is this species that close that you could have a Bigfoot baby? There'd be, there'd be many, many steps away from there, okay? Because the Australopithecines, um, they, the, the most, they, the, the uh, Paranthropus, the most recent fossil we have is about 800,000 years ago. Um, whereas uh, um, Homo, uh, Homo neanderthalus um, didn't arise until like maybe 100,000 years ago or 120 or something. So there's a big stretch of time there. And it's also, it's not like that Paranthropus is in line with, um, with Neanderthals or Denisovans for that matter, or mm -hmm. any of the other things that we think we interbred with. Um, it's possible that there might be some sort of interbreeding. I mean, certainly native people have, tell stories of Sasquatches abducting females and interbreeding with them, but the offspring always die quickly. Um, that's kind of one of those unknown sort of things. Like, is that myth and legend or is there a historical reality there? Um, and what are the genetics of it? We just don't know, but that's an interesting possibility. Have there been, um, have they found evidence, actual genetic uh, material that they could test? No, no. Yeah. Otherwise the whole mystery would be over at this point. Um, we have gotten uh, uh, some interesting hair samples, but there's no DNA in hair. And, and what, mm -hmm. little hair, what little DNA there is, is mitochondrial DNA from one side of the family, from mom basically, not dad. And, um, and it's really hard to get, and, but there have been eDNA studies done, mm -hmm. um, environmental DNA studies, where you, you, you take a sample of the environment mm -hmm. and you test it for DNA and you categorize the DNA in there. Those nests that I, that I mentioned earlier, they've been tested for eDNA, 
but the results were um, inconclusive because the DNA they got was fragmentary. It seemed to point to human. But if these things are paranthropocenes, like I think they are, I would expect a very, very human-like DNA out of there. But we're, we don't have enough of it to figure out what it is. In Russia, there the people went hunt. They went uh, camping and they disappeared, and nobody knows what happened to them. And they think yeah, the dots of the dots of something uh, pass uh, or whatever. Uh, pass. Yeah, that, I mean, that was a big we, hoax. That was a hoax. Oh, it was, was a no, hoax. No photograph of a Yeti that was done by an unscrupulous bottom feeding production company. Um, yeah, it, okay. which is rampant in the in the reality TV world. Unfortunately, there's a lot of nonsense they, and BS on TV. They were killed, I think, by a what do they call them? Aerobatic winds. No, avalanche or weather phenomenon it's, or something. When, I don't know. What right. it is. It's a when these certain mountains that are super cold can make their own storms. Can, mm -hmm. They've produced winds up to 200 miles an hour. Wow. So I think that's what, that's what happened to these people. You know, have you guys, like the, every time you hear about um, Yeti or Sasquatch or Bigfoot, they're out there, you might hear a, a terrible noise in the middle of the night. You know, have you heard of, of gentler interactions where people oh, yeah. have been able to spend time together with a, with a Yeti? Yeah, but, but you kind of get, that's where you get into the, you, where you're taking, because there's, these people have no evidence usually. So, but I, I've, we've talked to people that have, that we trust. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not something you can analyze, you know, like, like hair or footprint casts. Mm -hmm. or Are scat. you guys always looking for, for um, like physical evidence? Is that? Oh yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Get yeah. There's the, in Bigfoot, there's too much subjective evidence, stories right. told by people. But I mean, when you look at uh, people, you don't know how good of an observer they are. You don't know how their culture or religion or whatever is, is tainting their observations. Mm -hmm. You don't know about their language skills to communicate their experience to you. And you certainly don't, I mean, you probably know a little bit about your own ability to interpret, but how do you know you're interpreting what actually happened to them? So subjective stories are kind of squishy, shall we say. Mm -hmm. They might be good for court, but they're not good for science. So oh, we're, uh, Bobo and I and our colleagues always try to go the step beyond and get something that would be objectively interesting as opposed to subjectively interesting. But there are people that we know really well and ourselves that have, have had things happen that we can, and then when you spend, it's with the, the Bigfooting thing, you kind of have to spend time with people because on Finding Bigfoot, the TV show we did, I don't know if you guys saw that ever, but we'd, inter we'd go out and interview witnesses at the site where it happened. And we'd spend, you know, sometimes they'd be our main witnesses, so they'd be around us all week. And, you know, uh, by the end of the episode, you're like, I'm not so sure about this person's story, you know, because they seem like they're a little bit, like they misinterpreted other things out in the woods. Like they, they hear an owl and say, did you hear that? And it's like, yeah, I just heard a barred owl or, or a coyote or whatever it may be. So you kind of like start going, okay, this person's less reliable why, for what they're saying. But why do you think that is? Like, I mean, there's this sort of mythology of it. And, and you all just said earlier, like there is no DNA evidence and sort of things like that, right? It's been hard, it's, it's a challenge. It's like, it has been stayed in the consciousness and in our imagination for so long. But why is it that even someone would invent a story or, you know, you start to lose your faith in that, in that particular source? What do people want from this, this mythical Bigfoot? What do people, what do you think people yes. are really looking for? It's definitely different things. There's, there's, there's that, what everyone obviously says, like there's, I think you can break them into main categories. Like there's the hoaxers that are trying to, just trying to BS people and show, I, I fooled these guys. I'm smarter than they are. Yeah, these or suckers. money or attention, some sort of mental yeah, illness or something. Uh, yeah. yeah, or they want the attention. Just, um, they don't believe it. They, they don't believe what they're saying, but they just will go along with it, lying, knowingly. And there's people that honestly believe what they're saying and they think that they have this experience. And they're interpreting these sounds and maybe like a scared setting of something in the dark, something big moving. And they kind of conjure this whole thing in their mind. So that they'll be very convincing. You can tell they're not lying, but they just misinterpreted it. So there's, there's different. So the more time you spend with people, you can tell what category you can put them in. And there's other people that are just like, they just relay the facts pretty objectively like that. Most people would agree upon as being, this is, these are, the uh, observable facts is this, that was not identifiable. That we you don't know what that sound was, or um, or that was identifiable. Right. If you could, would you capture one? Probably not. Uh, that's tough. Well. Well, you, here's the hard. thing. Yeah, to, it would be virtually impossible to capture something almost as smart as us with hands that weighs 1,200 pounds, et cetera. But um, when you look at proving the species, um, unfortunately, our scientific model at this point demands what's called a holotype, which is a type specimen. It's a dead one. 
or a big chunk of a dead one to prove a species is real. To me, it seems kind of archaic and barbaric and a little Victorian for my taste, you know? So if, if possible, a live capture would be amazing. It'd be, it'd be nice to not have to kill one to prove it's real, right? Mm -hmm. Just like I, I, don't want, I don't want somebody to kill Bobo to prove that he's real because look at him, he's right there, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but really the... I mean, how do you do that? A pit trap? Come on, these things are, no. Uh, you can't tranquilize them because uh, um, we don't know anything about their physiology, about their metabolism, what kind of drugs would work, what, which one wouldn't. Because, um, you know, all animals need different drugs, essentially, to be tranquilized. And even if you, you know, and most of them are PCP or some derivative thereof, you know. And so you need a prescription. And you might as well ask for a prescription for PCP to go kill a leprechaun, you know, right. and, and if you do that, they're going to say, you've already had too much PCP and not give you any, um, because. And dosage too. You don't know if you're yeah, shooting dosage. a 500 pound one or a thousand pound one. You know, yeah. You give them too much, give them too little and they just run off. And then you give them too much, you can kill them. Yeah. Then there's accuracy problems with the darts because they're, they're only accurate to 30, 40 yards mostly. And, and there's just mm -hmm. so many problems with uh, live capture that but, it's kind of off the table. Do you even want to capture them? Is it that important to capture them? You know, is the idea here just the, you know, you're up against mysteries and you want to unpack the mystery of what it is? I think, I think we just, we're so certain you're not going to catch one alive. I mean, unless it was some huge government military operation, which, I mean, other than that, those work out really well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, right. just, it's just not even an option. I mean, you can talk about like, of, you know, like, as far as your ethics go, do you think it's this or that? But it's kind of one of those things where I don't spend much time on it because I just don't even think it's part of the equation. I mean, you could get one that's wounded that you could capture, like a small, like a, a small, I mean, because then they start off, they start off, you know, two, three feet tall. So, you know, if you, but they're with an adult always, so. Well, and consider this, but I mean, I've been look, I've been doing this for 26 years and Bobo has years on me. He's been doing it longer than I have. And both of us have worked our butts off to try to take a picture of one and neither one of us has. You know, a, a photograph, and I have a phone in my pocket most of the time. You know, right. um, I mean, for at least half my big footing career, and the cell phones weren't really a thing when I first started. But, um, but no, no. So you can kind of see the the problem there. If we're having trouble even getting a lousy picture of one, how how much more realistic would it be for me to have a tranquilizer dart that I have a prescription for these drugs loaded in the chamber, ready at all times in case one's within thirty yards of me? You know, it's just astronomically, uh, um, the odds are astronomically against us. When, yeah, you, get, you, get, get one by hunting, like a group of hunters like this. Uh, there's a project called Area X. Um, what is it? The, the North American, North American Wood Conservancy. Wood Conservancy, yeah. And, and those guys, they're, they're professional. They got scientists and they're uh, in Southeast Oklahoma. They, they're actively trying to kill one. They have like hunting, shooting teams out there like all summer long, like rotating in and out. And uh, they're, they're, if anyone's gonna get a body, it's those guys. Yeah, or or some guy who has a Sasquatch in his property and happens to be well armed and he's terrified of it at the same time. Right. I, I Which, think that kind of thing yeah. is a real possibility as well. Has your belief ever wavered, both of your individual belief? Well, I don't have a belief in Bigfoot. The evidence is there. Like a belief implies you think it's real despite a lack of evidence, like religion or politics, right? But the, the evidence is there. It's kind of like, I, I mean, my belief in dogs hasn't wavered a bit either um, because they're real too. You know what I mean? So the, I guess the answer is no on that because the evidence hasn't changed. Um, it, it, to think that Sasquatches are not real after, I mean, just set aside my personal experiences of tracking them, seeing them, smelling them, hearing them, etc. Um, and, and set aside the witnesses I've spoken to. The evidence, the footprint evidence alone is enough reason to absolutely be confident that they're real animals. And when you add all those other things on top of it, it's ridiculous for me to think that it's anything but a perfectly normal animal that's out there. Do you ever find um, scat from them? Or does a tracker find stuff of evidence of where they were? Yeah, but there's evidence that they hide their scat, like other predators, like mountain lions and stuff, will do the same thing. But yeah, they um, I've found their scat several times. Uh, it's like, it looks like big giant human dumps out out in the woods. But they've been seen extra uh, going to the bathroom in in water, like water, like creeks. Mm. Pond, they'll just take a dump right there, and it's gone. Like they, they're. And they're also very conscious about not leaving footprints. They'll avoid muddy areas. Um, not always, obviously, because they're prints. But what is it, Cliff? Like 
what's the percentage of where people claim to have seen one versus tracks being found? I mean, there's way more sightings than tracks. Uh, yeah, found. way more sightings like than 20 to tracks. 1 or something. Hmm. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's something like that. So I think it's 20 uh, to 1. Yeah, to give, an, to give you an idea, there's tens of thousands of eyewitness reports on record at this point, like literally tens of thousands. Um, and to compare that to footprints, for example, there's about 300, 350, maybe 400 footprint casts in the world. Now, certainly a lot of people find footprints and don't cast them. I don't know what that percentage is. But still, just kind of the rarity of the footprints kind of versus seeing one of these things, I, I, you know, because the substrate isn't conducive to Are you worried about them, them as endangered? I mean, you know, are, like, is our world going to just, you know, are they going to be able to survive in, in the world that we live in now and in our climate cement? Like, there's so many things going on in our world that are, you know, even the, our current conditions. Like, are you, are you, you're so protective of them, both of you. Like, you have great, this incredible, deep appreciation and love for them. You know, are you worried? That, that someone is going to try to go and, and, you know, kind of, would it be upsetting to, to capture one or try to kill one to try to understand it, to study it just for the sake of that? I mean, how do you feel emotionally about it? I feel uh, a mix. Like, I want to know about these things and we're, that's what it's going to take to really start understanding them. But I, on an emotional level, just knowing like, I mean, look how, uh, you know, the, emotions of other great apes i mean these things family these things are tight family bonds so i just think about god you know ripping away a young one from a mother or shooting you know someone's brother or husband father wife daughter whatever like shooting one of like just murdering it for our own curiosity just to me is, is just wrong but at the same time i know plenty of redneck dudes that are w wanting to pull the trigger and I, I more feel sorry for the ones that get wounded because they get shot all the time. They get wounded a lot. Like hunters, they, they get shot. We hear a lot of stories about people wounding them. So I, I, you can kind of say, well, if you just brought in one body and we kind of got some knowledge and education going on these things, maybe less of them will get shot overall. Maybe it'll be better for them to get their habitat protected. So, you, I mean, the guys that are out there trying to collect one, they have good arguments. And yeah. I, I don't agree with, I don't agree. It's, 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 does the end justify the means you get down to that? Well, the bottom line, as far as do I feel for the individual Sasquatches that's, that, that'll be killed eventually? Absolutely. But I think the species is doing a really good job taking care of themselves. Okay. Yeah, they are so smart and so adaptable and occupy such a wide variety of ecological niches that I'm not sure as, as a species, us, humans, I don't think we can do very much that's going to affect them very much. Okay. Like I think in some places, like in Florida, they have tend to have a, a, a habit of paving everything, paving all the wildlands, you know, the build Epcot centers and things like that's the thing that's going to damage them. That's what's going to hurt them because you're going to be isolating small genetic groups and then they'll be inbreeding and then they'll eventually kind of slowly peter out. And that's the same sort of thing that's happening to the Florida Panther, for example, Florida is one of those red zones that like, Oh yeah, well you can act, humans might actually affect them there, but, all the other stuff we do like logging and things like that doesn't really hurt them in fact it, it might even help them in some ways because once you cut all the trees down the sunlight reaches the forest floor and highly nutritious plants come in another year or two deer and rabbits and everything else are in there nibbling away and that's food for bigfoot you know um so and see i think that we're we're the only species that i know that actually you know that craps in our bed with any regularity you know and i think that uh our habits are gonna are going to cause our own extinction far before the Sasquatch. They are the meek that shall inherit the earth. And oddly enough, ironically enough, um, it, uh, if we are aware Sasquatches are there and we start being the, um, the stewards of our environment, as I think we should be, I'm going to start taking care of wild lands. And I, I'm not saying stop logging and mining all that, just like be more, a little more careful, a little more generous um, to the, uh, the, the native habit uh, inhabitants of Sasquatches and people like, and, you know, animals and stuff. Um, oddly enough, and ironically enough, it might cause us to leave a smaller footprint on the planet. Jesse's much more knowledgeable about this than I am, and you, clearly, the both of you. But are they no. widely, are they over, you know, are they, are they from all over the world? I mean, you mentioned these different parts. Well, of how many do you think there are, you guys? Uh, to, to, well, when we get more DNA, we'll have a better idea of that. But there has to be a minimum 2,500 in North America for a breeding population. But we all guesstimate six to ten thousand maybe up around twelve thousand at the most for all all of north america but you take into account british columbia is bigger than california oregon and washington put together 
and they have like a million point something people that live down the very bottom southwest corner, like another hundred thousand, be like a hundred thousand people from San Diego up to Canadian border, that same amount of territory, all mountainous, perfect Sasquatch habitat, a lot of water, food. So I mean there's however many we have here, there's more up there. Yeah, five Most or ten thousand or something like that, probably. I think is a good guess for continent wide, yeah. you know, you which know, sounds you, like a lot, but it's not. When you guys are out in the woods and you know, because I imagine you guys go camping together a lot, you know, and it's dark and you're listening, you know, what's the experience like? Because, I mean, you've obviously been doing it for years and years and years, and most nights it's nothing, but is every once in a while, hey, that might be one? It's yeah, a whole lot of empty, it. dark nights. <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah, which is why it's good to go with a friend, you know, because you can pass the time. But um, when they are there, um, it is exciting. It's like the adrenaline rush comes, and like I met, there's been a few times Bobo and I have been sitting out in the dark, and one or two are around, and we're hearing them, and we're going, "Did you hear that?" That's oh my god! We're like giggling like schoolgirls. It's the most exhilarating, fantastic thing. And you know, you can go out thirty nights in a row and not get anything, but then you get something, even if it's just one close knock or something like that. And you go, "I'm gonna do this the rest of my life. I'm doing this." And that's like one knock out of like thirty nights. And we're just hooked. It's ridiculous. Like we got a problem, man. Except that like this problem is a little less physically damaging than some other problems might be. Well, okay. incredible. I'm hooked now. Yeah. So. Thank you guys very much. Really, really, really appreciate oh, you coming on. Hey, throw, throw a shout out for uh, Cliss. Cliss actually got the biggest uh, Bigfoot collection museum in the world up there outside of Portland. Yeah, yeah, I own the North American Bigfoot Center in Boring, Oregon. Yes, Boring, Oregon is a town. Yeah. It's a little uh, um, uh, rural town outside of Portland on the way to Mount Hood. So I've got, I own a Bigfoot museum out here called the North American Bigfoot Center. Um, and Bobo and I do a podcast together. We don't want to give you competition or anything Please like that. Please give us competition. Tell us the podcast, uh, yeah. the address of the museum, the email okay. address of the museum. Oh, Please. North American Bigfoot Center at gmail.com. Nice and easy. Okay. North American Bigfoot Center dot com. North American Bigfoot Center. It's, it's, it's yeah. And, and what's the podcast called? Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. And we do it every single week. And we were 50 or 80 or something, probably 80 episodes in at this point. And nice. if like, uh, if any of your listeners want to hear more Squatch Talk, we're yeah. the guys. Come check it out. Okay. And where, where can they find that? Can they find that on Apple? You know, oh, I yeah. Can... All, the, all the major podcast yeah. sort of things. And we have a website with a player in it as well. Bigfootandbeyondpodcast.com yeah. yeah. has a player right built into the website. Come check it out. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. This Great. was really fantastic. Really appreciate it. Yeah, nice talking to you guys. Yeah, thank you, you very too. much for having us on. We appreciate it. Wow, you know, I don't know. I could. I was going either way. You know, I mean, I've, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm a very optimistic person, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a little skeptical. But then by the end of it, I want the DNA. I just want to say, what about some DNA? Well, you don't have to untangle every mystery. They certainly seemed passionate and we're looking for evidence I, I think their hearts in the right place i thought it was Amazing thing really wonderful have. yeah they're incredible and to have that kind of uh passion they have passion and yeah. the joy that comes from that and how about camping with a purpose yeah we were lucky to have them really have them on awesome. they're pretty okay i'll see you in the next one okay i'm gonna go watch Thank their you. podcast or listen to their podcast bye okay